Thanks, Jay. Well, if you have a Bible with you, if you'd like to turn to the book of Matthew, and we're in chapter 16 this week, and we're looking at another brilliant section today in this eyewitness account of the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at a couple of stories today where one of Jesus' followers by the name of Peter shows us both the best and the worst ways to respond to Jesus. And uh, before we dive into the story, we want to set the scene because what's been happening in the storyline of Matthew's Gospel is really important. Um, If you've been here or tuning in online over the last few weeks, you'll know that Jesus has been warning his disciples about what he called the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And that was just a way of describing their teaching that causes things to grow in people's lives. But not good things, harmful things. Because their teaching had kind of drifted away from being based on the whole counsel of what God had given them in his word. And that added a whole lot of human traditions and ways of thinking to it. Um, things that may have had a Bible verse or two to back them up, but weren't really representing all of what God had to say. It was like they'd taken a little bit of the Word and a whole lot of human ways of thinking and come up with their own systems for how they wanted people to live. And Jesus is warning his followers not to get trapped in that kind of approach to living. And the Sadducees, they kind of reflected more of what was happening in popular culture around them, uh, Greek thought, Roman thought, and so on. Uh, The Pharisees, they reflected a more traditional Jewish way of living, and they tried to protect people from these other kind of changes in society that they were trying to resist. So they were very, very different from one another, and they actually hated each other a fair bit. But they got together to oppose Jesus. And if we're honest... Uh, As we look around, even in the church today, you you tend to see those both kind of patterns where there are groups who very much seem comfortable with the popular culture of the day and tend to fit in with that and then there are churches who seem very, very uncomfortable with what's popular today and are trying to resist it with all their might but neither is the point. Jesus lumps them both in the same category and says, hey, be careful, don't live life on the basis of what these guys teach. Don't take a little bit of God's Word and a whole lot of human thinking, whether you're very, very traditional or very, very conforming to the culture around you, neither is going to be helpful to you. Uh, Neither of those things actually matters much. And whether you're a church that maybe looks a little bit like this, or maybe, and by the way, that's not me, this guy here. Could be my, my twin brother, but it's not me. Or you could be a church like this. And they they look very different and they have very different approaches to how they uh, teach and how they conduct life together and and how they fit in with the world around them. But neither of those things actually matter that much. They both can be awesome if Jesus is at the centre of what they do. And they both can be diabolical if they've lost sight of Jesus and the way they do what they do has become more important to them than actually following Jesus as their saviour and as their king. As long as Christ is at the centre, we will do what is right. But be careful, Jesus says, of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Don't go making your traditions and your ways of thinking about life the main thing. Jesus didn't praise the Pharisees for resisting popular culture and he didn't praise the Sadducees for going with popular culture because that just doesn't matter. It's living your life on the basis of what God commands. That's the key. And your particular traditions and what you prefer whether it's how churches gather or how you live your daily life, they're not the point either. What God says to you about how we ought to live and how we can know him, that's the point. That's what Jesus is really driving home to his followers. And that's why he asks them this really cool question as our story for today begins. In, Rome, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13, we pick up the story. where Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples... Who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, there's a really good reason why Jesus takes his followers on this field trip away from where they were usually ministering, off to this area where they didn't normally go. Um, He went there to ask them this question very specifically. And I want to show you what the area would have looked like at the time. Uh, Around Caesarea Philippi, the the, the settlement was down the hill a little bit, but close by to the the town uh, was this kind of grotto, this area where there's a whole stack of temples and niches carved into the wall where all of these pagan gods were worshipped. There's temples to Greek gods and Roman gods and goddesses. And the most significant temple was the temple to the god 
Japan. Um, but those were relatively recent over the last few centuries. When you go back into the Old Testament, you discover that even a thousand years earlier, the people of Israel had gone to this spot and set up places of pagan worship. It was an area known for idolatry, rejecting the commands of God and pursuing human-centered religion, human ideas about how the universe worked and how to get ahead in life and all that kind of stuff. And there's a reason that so many idols and temples and things were put on this site. You see, in the way of thinking back then, high places were associated with being closer to the gods. And this mountain, Mount Hermon, was the largest mountain in the whole region. It's like this massive rock. And so the, at the base of Mount Hermon, where you could get closer to the gods, they built all these temples. But not only was there this huge rock, Mount Hermon, but there was a cave going down into this rock. And you might be able to just see it on the side there. I'll point it to on this side there. Um, let me give you a photo of what the site looks like today. They didn't have drone photography in Jesus' day, but today we do. So this is from a little bit higher up in the sky. And you can look down into that cave. And that cave was thought to be an entrance to the underworld. And so you had this high place where you can get closer to the gods, but you could also have access to the underworld in this site. There were some artesian springs that bubbled out from that cave, and um, that was where they, they believed the god Pan would come up and uh, bless the earth from. And do you know what they called it, this entrance into the underworld? They called it the Gates of Hades. Right? Some of you may have heard that expression, if not... Stay tuned, you'll hear about it in a few minutes. And quite possibly, as he was close to this site, and he was in the region uh, of this site, Jesus asks his followers, who do people say that I am? Surrounded by all of these other temples, all these other gods, all these other ideas about how to get close to God, whether it's gods above or gods below, uh, surrounded by all these other human ideas and religions and false religions, Jesus says, now who do people say that I am? And the story continues in verse 14. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, if you've been here for a few weeks, you might remember how uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these religious leaders, were always coming up to Jesus and asking him to prove who he was by showing them more signs and wonders. And Jesus eventually got to the point of saying, you know, enough is enough. I've shown you that I am the Messiah. All of these works that I've done testify to me. You're, you're only going to get one more, and that is the sign of Jonah. And if you're here, you'll remember what the sign of Jonah was all about. It symbolizes the fact that Jesus would be killed, he would be buried, and on the third day, he would rise again. That would be the thing that would finally prove, hey, I am the Messiah, the promised Savior King. But he's turned to his followers now after saying, well, who, who are these other people saying that I am? And they have various ideas about who Jesus is. And he says to his followers, well, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This is a wonderful moment where Peter has got it. He's grasped something by faith. He's given the perfect answer. He's seen what natural eyes couldn't reveal. This was a God moment where Peter's actually seen the truth. And Jesus affirms that by saying this, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So dig into the rich symbolism of what's going on in this story. Surrounded by temples to other gods, uh, surrounded by this site where there's this huge rock and this place called the Gates of Hades, Jesus says this to Peter. He says, on this rock, I'll build my church. Not any of these other temples full of empty, meaningless religion that doesn't actually have any truth and doesn't actually achieve anything worthwhile. I will build my church on this rock. Not this huge rock, Mount Hermon, that was in front of them, but upon Peter, whose name, this nickname that Jesus has given him, Peter, means rock. Why did Jesus give him that nickname? Why did Jesus say to Simon, your name is now Peter, the rock, and I'm going to build my church on you? Because he was the first of the disciples to recognize who Jesus is. Jesus is God's promised saviour. He's God's promised king. And they'll all come to that point, and together they will all be the foundation upon which God's church is built. 
But what does that even mean, that I'll build my church on this foundation? Well, Jesus, of course, doesn't leave us in the lurch. He goes on to explain what he means. And we read from verse 19. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. And from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. See, Jesus is going to entrust these men, starting with Peter, but then all the disciples, and we read more about that as Matthew's gospel continues, they will all become this foundation for the church. And how do they actually do that? How is Jesus building his church upon these men? Well, he's going to entrust them with the keys to the kingdom. What are they? Well, it's simply the message that Jesus had to die to take the penalty for our sins but that he would rise again on the third day, breaking the power of death over us. They would be the witnesses. They saw these things happen just as Jesus prophesied. They would be the ones who understood what they meant and could explain that to other people. And as we hear the message that these apostles have now transferred to us, Uh, They've dictated in in the scriptures, they preached it to massive crowds. As they then told the world the message of what Jesus did, dying and rising again, we understand that by believing in Jesus as the one who died in our place, taking the penalty for our sins, but not staying dead, rising again to eternal life, believing that is how we are forgiven, how we are seen by God as his perfect children, how we can be a part of God's family, how we can know that death has no hold over us. And Jesus said that the gates of Hades won't prevail against his church. What's he talking about? Well, you've seen this place over there, this gateway into the underworld where people are throwing their sacrifices, often goats and things that will be cast into there never to return. They're hoping this false god Pan is going to accept their gift. And Jesus is like, well, actually, I'm going to be a sacrifice, a very different kind of sacrifice. I'm going to be the one who goes into the grave to take the penalty for your sins, to take the punishment you deserve. But I'm not going to get stuck down there. The gates of Hades can't hold me in. I'm going to rise again. I'm going to conquer death. And I'm going to be the reason that you're going to be confident that you don't have to be afraid of death either. You don't have to feel guilty before God. Your sins are forgiven. You don't have to be afraid of death. You've been given eternal life. This is great news because of what Jesus has done. What's this loosing and binding business? If the apostles, Peter and the other disciples, are the foundation of the church because they have the keys to the kingdom, the message of what Jesus has done to give us eternal life, to bring us into God's family, why does he then go on and talk about loosing and binding? What is that stuff? Well, see, this is another important role that they are going to play. Not only do they have the job given by Jesus to make sure the whole world knows that Jesus has come, died in our place and risen again so that we could be a part of God's eternal kingdom, there's something else that he is going to entrust them to do which is really, really important for the church. Do you know what that is? Well, it's this bit here. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. But what on earth does that mean? For those guys, they knew what it meant because it was a figure of speech that they were very familiar with. See, again, we have to rewind to what's been going on with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those religious leaders. And you know what part of their job description was? They were in charge of something that they called binding and loosing. In other words, they had the responsibility to say to the whole nation, this is what God says you can do. This is what God says you must not do. This is what you are free to do. This is what you are not free to do. They were the ones who were in charge of saying to the people, this is what fits in God's kingdom. This is what does not fit in God's kingdom. And they had a kind of a colloquial saying that was called binding and loosing. So what's Jesus entrusting his apostles to do here? They're going to be the ones who lay down for the church that will be built upon them what God wants for his people. What he wants us to do, what he does not want us to do. What he has freed us to be able to do, what he has freed us from doing. These are the people that God is going to entrust to put all that down for us so that we know as people who have been brought into God's kingdom how we should live as a part of God's kingdom. And Peter has just shown, I'm not controlled by 
the Pharisees and the Sadducees and who they say you are. I'm not control, controlled by popular opinion and what anyone else says about Jesus. I have just received a revelation from God. This is the truth. And in the same way that God helped Peter to understand not human thinking, but the truth from God about who Jesus is, in the same way God is going to give Peter and those other apostles the revelation they need to be able to say this is what God wants for us and this is what God does not want for us to lay down for the church that foundation so that we know how we can live so it's a wonderful ministry that Jesus is calling Peter and then as I mentioned earlier the rest of the uh, disciples as they receive that ministry from Jesus as well so all of that is in response to Jesus uh, noticing in Peter that he was able to hear the revelation of God, not the wisdom of people, and is able to speak it out. That's what happened the first time. But look what happens the second time as we finish uh, this particular reading. See, Jesus, having heard Peter say, you're the Messiah, you're the one God promised to send to save us from sin and death. He's recognized it, brilliant. Then Jesus goes on to say, well, this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to need to die, but I will rise again. And what is Peter's response? Verse 22 tells us, Peter takes Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. And Jesus turned to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. This is amazing. In the space of eight verses, Peter has gone from being the rock that Jesus is going to build his church on to the stumbling block that Jesus is tripping over and is in the way of Jesus building his church. That is a huge turnaround. And what's the difference? In the first case, Peter heard from God and said what God revealed to him as being the truth. In the second case, Peter was just thinking like any other person. He was following the ways of human beings as we think about life and as we think about what we want out of life. He'd stopped listening to God. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees, Jesus had said just a little bit earlier. Remember that? Don't fall for human ways of thinking and human ways of approaching life, adding your ways of thinking to what God has said and thinking you've got it all worked out. No, do what God actually says. And Peter has unknowingly fallen for that very trap. It must have felt terrible, don't you reckon? To have gone from the blessed are you, Peter, because this wasn't revealed to you by man, but by God, to get behind me, Satan. You are thinking like a human being. What a terrible turnaround that would have been, but what an important experience for Peter. Because as the person who God was going to entrust with the words that would guide the future of the church, Peter needed to learn to listen to God and not follow the ways of people. He needed to be rock solid in his own conviction. He needed to be able to identify what he himself was doing in those moments. How heartbroken it must have been for Peter when he realized he was actually doing what Satan himself had done back in Matthew 4. No, no, don't go that path. I'll give you the kingdoms of the earth, Satan said to Jesus. And Peter's now saying the same thing. No, 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 you don't have to do that. That'd be terrible. Let's do it another way. He's actually serving the wrong master here. And Jesus actually is kind enough, even though he's very stern, to point out to Peter, hey, hey, you're serving the wrong team here, buddy. Need to get back on track. Need to start listening to God again instead of following your own thinking. You see, Jesus would build his church. The gates of Hades have not and will not ever overcome it. Jesus has conquered the grave. Peter and the other disciples would be entrusted with the very words of God breathed out through them so that as we read the New Testament, these uh, books, these letters that they have dictated or authored, we know, hey, this isn't just their thoughts. This was God revealing himself to them, just like he did with Peter in this story. And we can base our lives on that confidently as a result. So we want to be like Peter. We want to believe the things that God has revealed about Jesus, not letting the opinions of others get in the way. We, we don't want to follow our own natural way of thinking or the way our culture does or what anyone else teaches. We want to recognize Jesus as our saviour, king. But we also don't want to be like Peter. We don't want to think that we have a better plan. We don't want to take a little bit of the truth and then add our thoughts as to how it should look. We want to only listen to what God has revealed and let that guide our lives, to let God renew our mind and transform our lives. 
So if you've been here over the last few weeks, you'll probably be thinking, Mike, this is kind of the same sermon from last week and kind of a bit the week before. And it kind of is. Because Jesus is pretty much saying the same thing, but in different ways and adding more to it. He's really wanting to drive home the the point, hey, make sure it's the actual words of God that you base your life on, not the thinking of people. He's really driving that home strongly, both in his conversation with the Pharisees and Sadducees, and now as he takes his followers apart. He really wants us to know that point deeply. Um, And as we know that and live it with conviction, that's how we live the kind of lives that God wants us to live. Um, Let me tell you a story of what this plays out like in my life from yesterday. Yesterday was Angry Saturday. Have you ever had a a day like that? Um, It wasn't the whole day, but there was a section of the day. Here's how it happened. Um, Laurie had invited me to come and play basketball on their team because one of their players was injured, and I was really looking forward to it. Uh, The game was at a particular time, and I'd made sure that I'd organized things so that I could be there 20 minutes early with Josiah who, so we could shoot around. Um, I haven't played basketball for a really long time, um, haven't done anything that vaguely relates to fitness for a really long time. So I knew, hey, it would be kind of good to warm up, to maybe get a bit of touch. So I would made the plan, uh, put everything in place to, to execute the plan. Then things went awry. And I'm, I'm going to spare you the gory details of who was responsible for things getting messed up in our household. Tempting to get back at them in a public forum by naming and shaming, but I'm not going to do that. But things got messed up. And instead of being 20 minutes early, I was a few minutes late. And instead of Josiah being able to come and watch his dad play basketball, I had to leave him behind. And I was really ticked off about it. Um, I was a bit nervous about playing, and so the nerves probably played a factor. But um, there were a few choice phrases bubbling around in my head as I dealt with my frustration. And you guys know that whenever you're frustrated, there's always going to be more reasons to be frustrated. So you're driving down and you're running late and the guys ahead of you, they're side by side, 10 k's under the limit. I mean, it always happens, doesn't it? And, and so there's all this fuel to be thrown onto the fire. And for those of you who have known me for a while, you'll know that I've admitted this freely before. Um, anger management, you know, it's something that we all wrestle with and we all have particular things that we do well and particular things that, you know, we don't do well. For me, basketball, that's been the thing I've not done so well over the course of my journey. Um, and so I'm heading to the place which is my, my most dangerous place in terms of losing the plot and yelling at umpires and just getting really stroppy with myself and all that kind of thing. And I'm already worked up. Um, and as I'm in the car, um, God, by his kindness, th- through the presence of the Holy Spirit who lives within all of God's people, kind of reminds me, hey, you're heading to a place which is a pretty dangerous place for you if you're already angry. Um, You need to deal with that right now. And here's the thing. Uh, Jesus gave these apostles the authority to bind and loose, and and they speak about anger in the New Testament. Uh, One of the phrases, for example, is, for human anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. When we are driven by our anger, we don't live the right lives that God wants us to live. That's, that's just the way that it is. And I know that if I stay angry, I am not going to do what God wants me to do. And, and there might be all kinds of really good reasons for me to be angry, but as a follower of Jesus, as part of God's church built on the foundation of these apostles who had the authority to say what fits and what doesn't fit in his church, guess what? I am not given permission to be an angry man. In fact, the opposite is true. I'm told to turn away from anger. You know, forgiveness. I'm, I'm not free to hold on to a grudge for that person who made me late. I'm not free to abuse the umpire. And he, well, I'll tell you about that bit of the story in a second. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, I just don't have permission. So whether I feel like doing it, whether my teammates think it's okay for me to do it, whether I'm in the habit of doing it, whether there's justified reasons for me to do it, none of that stuff matters. The Bible just doesn't give me permission to hold on to anger and act out of anger toward others. And as a follower of Jesus, I only have one choice. Turn away, ask God to help me to live a different way. It's the only choice. And that's true in managing anger, that's true in managing your sexual morality, that's true in handling your finances, that's true in managing all your relationships, that's true about your approach to your vocation, that's true to how you live with people in a family, that's true to how you conduct your friendships. Every single part of your life has words of God spoken into it. And if you are a follower of Jesus, it's not like, oh, I'll take that under advisement. You can't rock up like Peter and say, well, Jesus, you might think that, but I know the better way. No. No. You actually just do what God says. And you know the results? The results of obedience are blessing. 
you get to live as a citizen of the kingdom, which is so much better than just living as a citizen of the world. So how did it play out in my case yesterday? I had to own my anger and I had to ask for God's help to turn away from it. Um, I had to plan in advance. You know what? You're not going to make any snide comments when you get home. You're going to forgive now. And yes, there are some things that need to be talked about, but you're going to do that in love, not out of revenge. So I had to deal with it in that moment. I rocked up. I step onto the court late. Thanks, Laurie, for being so gracious about it. Um, and they only had four players till I got there. It did not make me feel great. Um, so I step onto the court. First play of the game, I get called for a foul. And it was not a foul, let me tell you. The umpire was behind me. I was reaching that way. I'm like, oh, ball, ref. Now, if I had not reminded myself to obey the commands of Scripture, guess what angry Mike would have looked like in that moment? The ref would have copped a spray, let me tell you. But as it was, because God had already helped me to remember the command and obey it, didn't worry me. I just didn't get upset about that. And I actually had a really nice time. We had a fun game of basketball. Uh, well, I wasn't awesome, but I wasn't expecting to be. Um, I got through it um, and uh, managed to help in a, a couple of situations. I went home, had a nice time with the family. The day was so good. But it wouldn't have been if I hadn't obeyed the commands of God. And that, that's true in every part of your life too. So the, the ministry of these apostles, binding and loosing, sometimes like, oh, I don't want to have to do what God says I have to do. You feel a bit bound by what God says in his word sometimes. You know what that's actually doing? It's loosing you to flourish in life. As you listen to the actual commands of God, not our tradition, not your inclination, not the customs of the world around you, not what everyone else is doing, none of that junk, as you just do what God says, life's better. That's what Jesus is saying to Peter that he's going to do in his life. That's what we inherit today. And that's a huge blessing to us. Let's pray. God, thank you for this wonderful 